So, um, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for, for tuning in. Um, my name is Marcel Heine. I'm uh, the founder of um, URIDU. Uh, URIDU is a German uh, nonprofit organization that has been around for five, six years, um, developing and implementing um, technologies, content, and uh, strategies um, to provide accessible knowledge uh, to marginalized women, women in the global south. Um, here I'm today talking about open source equality, um, a way to promote gender equality and women's empowerment through open source solutions built um, by women. Um, what I would like to do today is basically line out um, the, um, the relevance for open source solutions, <laughs> the relevance for open source solutions for development cooperation um, provide a link between women's empowerment and uh, sustainable uh, development and also show how we're trying to implement um, this um, in the field. Um, first of all, um, I would like to kind of narrate a bit um, to illustrate uh, uh, the problem. So, um, each and every day, um, uh, uh, a task that uh, um, most of the women in Sub-Saharan Africa are fulfilling is to uh, bake the local uh, flat bread. This is like a very simple bread. It usually has like two or three ingredients, flour, water, and some salt, and it's baked open uh, over an open fire. Um, it, the, the whole process consists in mixing the ingredients and um, women do not use, uh, of course, they do not use any scales or measuring cups. They are measuring the ingredients by eye. So, if, uh, and the woman knows, if the dough is too runny, she will make a mess instead of, uh, of bread. So if it's too runny, she will skip adding water and uh, adding flour instead. If it's too runny, skip the water. This is the simple rule. And this simple rule kills more than 2,000 children every single day. And here's why. Um, Africa leads uh, the world in teenage pregnancies. In fact, um, more than half of the births um, that are accounted for uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa are uh, by teenage uh, uh, mothers. So now imagine that um, such, such a teenage mother who hasn't had any access to, to education, who is most likely literate, that her child um, has diarrhea for the first time. So she, she doesn't have a concept of diarrhea. She doesn't have a concept of the human body, etc. So what she will do is basically she will apply her everyday knowledge to the problem. Remember, if it's too runny, skip the water. And this simple rule um, costs the life of more than 2,000 children every day. Um, diarrhea, in fact, is the second leading cause in, of death among children under five uh, worldwide. It kills more children than AIDS, malaria, and measles combined. So um, I've, I've given this example to illustrate um, the effects of lack of access to knowledge for rural women in the, in the global south. As a matter of fact, this does not only affect health uh, issues, but every single aspect of women's lives um, from psychological, economical to social implications. Um, to give you like an idea um, of the scope of this problem, uh, more than more than 500 million women are illiterate in the global south. So um, the question is, what can we do about this? What can we do um, to um, to stop this? Um, should we wait until every girl has had access to education? Well, um, good luck with that. The f in fact, um, while literacy rates have been going down over the last 50 years, the total number of illiterate people has remained the same. So we had like 500 million illiterate women in the 70s and we still have them. So um, this problem isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, if we continue by this pace, uh, we will achieve, for example, in India, full literacy in 65 years. So this shows that we really have to act today. The, um, the good, uh, the, uh, the good news is that, that we, today we have different options than we had like five decades ago. Today we have digital technologies. More than 500 years ago, Johannes Gutenberg created the printing press and revolutionized the way we disseminate uh, knowledge and information. Today we can create like an oral language printing press. 
Um, the ingredients for this are digital audio, MP3, the development of MP3 more than 30 years ago has uh, changed how we can disseminate audio for us. We take it for granted, but um, when it comes to providing uh, vital knowledge to marginalized populations in the global south, is uh, digital audio is nothing short of revolutionary. Secondly, we have mobile phones and those devices give you access to digital audio anywhere. And, and third, uh, well, we have open source, which enables us to build tools that can be used and accessed by local stakeholders in the country where it actually matters in the global south. So let me first establish the link between, between um, uh, women and uh, sustainable development. Um, when we talk about sustainable development, we, we, we soon we come to talk about the sustainable development goals. Sustainable development goals have been established uh, in 2015 um, by the United Nations to pave the way towards a um, sustainable uh, world. Um, they consist of 17 different goals, um, starting from um, zero hunger, no poverty, etc. And if you look at the 17 goals, and if you would like to pick out some, one goal that is more important than, than any other, then um, you will find that this is the SDG 5, gender equality. Each of the sustainable development goals has um, sub-goals and indicators, and uh, SDG 5 is linked to quite a large number of those targets and indicators. So we can really say that SDG 5, gender equality and women's empowerment is a bedrock to the sustainable development goals as a whole. And to underline that, we can, we can take a few examples and we'll find many more if you, if you uh, do uh, some research. So this is a, a very um, general um, quote that is given by many development uh, um, organizations is that women spend 90% of their earned income on their families while men spend only 35%. So um, this shows that empowering women has and empowering women economically has a very strong effect on the families, on the communities. To illustrate that a bit better, there's a specific study that shows that maternal income increases family nutrition by four to seven times more than income of fathers. So one dollar earned by the mother gives the family four to seven times more food than one dollar earned by the father. Um, also true is that closing the gender gap in agriculture could lift 100 to 150 million people out of hunger. Closing the gender in, uh, gap in agriculture me means giving women the same rights and access to land, cattle, funding and knowledge to improve uh, the livelihood of their families and to improve um, their uh, agricultural output. Another fact um, um, that has been stated by Project Drawdown, a scientific project that um, uh, evaluates different uh, different um, solutions to um, decrease um, the CO2 emissions is that quality education for girls and rights-based access to voluntary family planning for women could lead to a reduction um, of nearly 70 gigatons um, of CO2. So this is like a, a huge number. This is like a very important factor. And I think this outlines why um, gender equality and women's empowerment is essential um, to achieve uh, a sustainable uh, future for all of us. And in fact, the development cooperation has, of course, noticed that. So the European Union uh, will make gender equality and women's empowerment uh, a cross-cutting uh, cross priority. Um, by 2020, uh, 2025, 85% of new European Union actions should contribute to achieving these objectives. Also, Germany, the country where our organization is from, has established a feminist development policy for sustainable development, uh, taking into account the relevance of women's empowerment for sustainable future. And if you, if you want to look for the link between women's empowerment and technology, we don't have to go far because um, the SDG 5 target 5B um, already announces that it is important uh, to enhance the use of enabling technology, in particular information and communications technology to promote the empowerment of women. So what we have seen now is that uh, women's empowerment, gender equality, metaphor is sustainable development, and we can and should use digital tools to, um, to support that. Let me talk now about the opportunities that arise from this for local stakeholders and for, for us as a, as a community. Um, to, to kind of outline, uh, I'm usually, usually using this photo I took five years ago in Uganda, and it shows how we are 
providing knowledge um, in marginalized areas today. This is a community health worker that takes a risky ride on the back of a motorbike twice a year to reach this village. He grabs the megaphone and he talks about an hour about a topic, in this case, a case about tuberculosis. And, and people have a lot of questions about many topics because he is basically their Wikipedia, their Google, everything uh, twice a year for one hour. And if you look at that, um, well, you can definitely see that we should do better than that. We, we should come up with something that is scalable, something that is sustainable, and something that is digital. And this is actually the starting point for, for everything um, that we are doing. So the case for open and inclusive tools for development is that governments and, and the United Nations Development Program, um, Global Network, urgently need uh, digital solutions. And this is a quote from UNDP. This is not a quote, uh, this is not my quote. UNDP also says that a well-designed digital solution can impact millions of lives and support populations in new and innovative ways. To design those tools, um, um, development cooperation organizations have established something that we call the principles for digital development. And, and those principles state that this, the development of those tools should be open source based on a human-centered design and be developed uh, locally. And um, this is like a kind of a top-down approach. So um, um, the United Nations Secretary General's Roadmap for Dip Digital Cooperation consists of eight pillars that um, outline how digital tools can be used to attain the SDGs. And one of those eight pillars is called digital public goods. Digital public goods is like a pretty novel term. It has been coined, I think, in 2018. But it's basically just open source software, open data, open AI, open standards, open content that helps attain the SDGs. So it's something, it's, it's not totally new. It's just um, a, a new term to, to, um, to, to basically um, um, explain that those open technologies are here to attain, uh, attain the SDGs. Um, there, is, there are already um, institutions, organizations that have been created um, to support this. There's a Digital Public Good Alliance and um, this, is, this is something that is already there in place and this shows that there is a, a, a commitment from the top to implement those open tools. Um, Definitely, digital is the way forward in development cooperation. So, open digital tools will play an important role in development cooperation, as we as we can see. And we, we also notice that more and more uh, requests for proposals, which is basically the the mechanism um, that uh, that uh, uh, by which um, local organizations get funding, more of those RFPs um, uh, require the use of open digital tools. And um, this, of course, is opening up opportunities for local software and content uh, developers. The conclusion uh, that we can draw from this is that there's a growing need for locally developed open source solutions that contribute to SDG 5, gender equality and women's empowerment, and follow a human-centered design approach. Now, this is all very nice, and this is all, well, pretty theoretical. So, but what, what does that actually mean for, oops, okay. What does that actually mean for um, um, in, in practice? So basically, what does it mean for the stakeholders in the Global South that need to implement this? And um, to analyze this, I'm kind of splitting up the stakeholders into the demand side, which is um, NGOs and community-based organizations, which will be using those tools, and the supply side, which will be um, software developers who are developing those tools. If we look at the demand side, um, the NGOs and CBOs, um, well, we are talking about digital transformation. And uh, as all of us know, um, usually organizations that have been working for many decades with the same structures, principles, etc., are kind of reluctant to digital transformation. And the same happens, of course, uh, uh, with NGOs and CBOs. So um, they are often not aware of the opportunities that digital tools provide, and uh, they prefer um, working the way they have been working for the last 40, 50 years. Also, NGOs often struggle to go digital in low resource environments. So if you talk to people, they say, yeah, I have a smartphone and we have a computer, but in the field, in the countries, on the countryside, um, people do not have those tools. So uh, digital, using digital tools doesn't make sense. 
And uh, third, um, which is also a critical point, NGOs and CBOs often lack funding, expertise, and digital skills. So we need to create awareness. We need to provide capacity building to empower and enable those local stakeholder, local organizations to be part of this new ecosystem that should build um, um, local uh, open solutions. If you look at the supply side at software developers, um, we, we have to differentiate between open source in the global north and the open source in the global south. Those are quite different scenarios. So often local developers in the global south don't see open source and NGOs as an opportunity. So they prefer to go into the commercial markets, develop maybe application and find other business models than working on open source that is uh, dedicated to, um, to be used by NGOs. Also important is to know that volunteering is often unsustainable in the global south. So um, while we, we should be aware that um, uh, volunteering on an open source project is, is kind of a luxury that we have because we have the financial means, we have the time, we can, we can, we can do that. In the global south, the situation is quite different. And this is, uh, this is what, most, what makes the participation often very difficult. And another important point is, if we, remember, we talked about um, um, developing human-centered uh, uh, tools that are based on human-centered design. So if you're talking about gender uh, equality, those tools should be developed by women, by local women in the Global South. And now we all know that only 6% of open source contributors worldwide are women. So this makes the human-centered design for female beneficiaries very difficult. And this here is not the time and place to discuss the difficulties that, that uh, women uh, face when contribu contributing to, to, open, uh, to open source uh, solutions. There's a lot of research on that. And this is uh, just an image um, out of a paper that is kind of a, a review of literature uh, uh, of those issues. And that outlines the, 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 the problems and the potential solutions to improve the situation. But we, and this is, those are factors that are generally true for women um, who want to participate in open source. If we talk about the, the global south, we will find that there are additional problems. Gender norms and gender roles play an even more important role in, in the global south. So um, software development is seen as a main activity. Uh, in our project in Uganda, when I talk to developers, they say often the female developers drop out once they are looking for a husband because um, they want to increase uh, their, their chances of finding a husband and um, being employed in a, in a, in a male uh, role um, doesn't help them. So um, also um, the point that I already mentioned, the time to volunteer is kind of a, a luxury and privilege that we have and that volunteering is often unsustainable for many low income women in the global south. Another part is the challenges are the challenges of cross-cultural communication. Many, most open source projects are dominated by white males and um, um, this leads to certain um, um, difficulties in, in communication when it comes to working on such uh, projects. So if we, if we look at the, at the challenges, we can say, we must say that building those local, local open source solutions that support SDG5 uh, in order to do that, we need to stimulate and strengthen the local ecosystem. We need to create awareness. We need to provide capacity building. We need to provide safe spaces for female developers to participate in those projects. Now, um, now we've seen what the opportunities and the challenges are. And, and now I would like to introduce you to um, basically the approach that we have developed so far to, to tackle those issues. Um, well, we have been kind of paving this way since 2016. Um, in, in 2016, we've, after some, some time of research, we founded our nonprofit Uridu. And since then, we had like um, projects, uh, digital projects in, in 14 countries throughout Asia, Africa, and Latin America, where we developed um, digital solutions with local partners for different local settings. Um, so we work closely with NGOs and CBOs. Most of this work was funded by the EU and the German government, but also by um, CSR and, and individual uh, donations. One major part of this work was the creation of Audiopedia. Audiopedia is a wiki-based platform for digital audio content 
Because the thing is, if you want local organizations to use audio, it's a good idea to provide them with um, ready-made um, um, audio uh, files that they can use, for example, to communicate um, symptoms of tuberculosis in Swahili. So it is, for, especially for community-based organizations, it, it is very difficult to, to come up with uh, such content. So um, we provide them um, like uh, off-the-shelf content that they can use um, in their uh, communication. Um, during those years, we have developed a range of solutions that allow us to provide digital audio in basically any situation, um, um, independent from the level of digital inclusion and accessibility. So basically, we started on the left side, where there is no access to mobile coverage, no access to electricity, where we have been working with solar audio players. They have a, a solar panel on the back side. Uh, we've worked with those in the, in the uh, rainforest of the, uh, of the Congo Basin with nomadic pygmy tribes, the, the, the most difficult situations you can imagine, and they work. Um, but it is not really scalable. So um, what you often find in, in rural areas is a feature phone, the good old feature phone, uh, like the Nokias we used to use in the past. Um, it's a good idea to use, for example, an SD card with those. This is, it gives very good results. Most of those phones can play back MP3. So this is a very good way. Then where it's limited access, we can use hotspots. This is also an open source product, uh, project that uses a Raspberry Pi to provide those contents uh, uh, using a local web server. But we can also use smart feature phones, which are not known in our in the global north. Those are basically um, feature phones. They don't have, uh, they have like the key, uh, the keypad, no touch screen, but they use Firefox OS to run web applications and run WhatsApp, for example, which makes it uh, feasible to work with them. They cost like $14, $15. And of course, in the best of all worlds, uh, people are using smartphones and WhatsApp. WhatsApp is, of course, uh, can be a game changer uh, for a development corporation or for providing those contents. Take, for example, India, where we have the highest number of illiterate uh, women, 200 million. In India alone, 390 million people use WhatsApp. So um, if you use Audiopedia, if you take an audio file, send it through WhatsApp, uh, using WhatsApp to your beneficiaries, you are already doing like a digital community outreach. But we also use um, developing web applications that make those contents accessible. If you think about um, the, 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 the obstacles uh, that women's are, uh, women are facing while using um, digital tools are affordability. This is one thing, but we see that um, devices are becoming more and more uh, affordable. But the most important thing is accessibility. Even if a, if a woman can afford a device, it does not mean that she will you can use it properly because um, there are, um, she, she might be facing uh, a literacy gap and uh, especially a digital literacy gap. So you have to carefully develop user interfaces that enable those women to access uh, those contents. And um, in order to, to do that, um, now that we have um, basically, now that we know what works, now that we have the tools, we are starting kind of um, um, open sourcing them by creating this uh, open source for equality initiative, where we are trying to um, basically uh, convene different stakeholders, bring them together, international organizations, NGOs, local NGOs, content creators, and software developers, in order to create like an ecosystem that can help build those tools locally. So this is the idea behind open source for equality. You can say that open source for equality is a, a global initiative um, to promote the development and use of free and open software that supports women's empowerment and gender equality. So this is the part where we are trying to convene partners, where we're trying to create awareness, where we're trying also to build capacity among NGOs and community-based organizations. At the same time, open source for equality is a beginner-friendly safe space for women to participate in real-life open source projects in collaboration with local women's organizations. So we want to really um, give a platform for local female developers to participate in those projects that are actually real-life uh, uh, projects. So my solution, the solution that I am building here, is being used by a local NGO to empower women in my country. That is the, that is the core idea behind all that. The process, per se, works like that. We always have a local partner, a local organization that already works, ideally works with local female developers. And they host, uh, for example, Open Source for Equality Challenge and uh, support entry-level developers with mentors. Then we have the local developers, they, which engage in open source uh, project, building a, a real-life solution for a local organization. 
in a safe, uh, beginner-friendly uh, space for women. And then we have different open source projects on which those developers can work. So basically, we are com we are taking an NGO with uh, with a kind of a need for a specific solution, and we kind of match this NGO with local developers, female developers, developers ideally, and then the solution is being developed for this organization. Um, the different solutions that we that we are currently hosting, and this is just a start, so we are open to uh, to include more and more solutions, um, as long as they um, um, they the, their goal is to support SDG five. We have uh, the the before mentioned Audiopedia, which is a health uh, education audio content um, wiki, if you want. We have WOMFM. This is kind of a uh, accessible audio player platform. So basically, you have a QR code, you have a short URL, and um, you use your smartphone, and it will basically pop up. A web app will pop up, and you can play back uh, the audio. We have um, a, a framework that we are calling Augmented Audio. Uh, this is a JavaScript framework, which which combines audio with uh, with uh, with images with still images and with interaction to provide a platform that, uh, um, well, um, makes it easy to create um, e-learning uh, applications for marginalized populations. And one of the benefits of this approach is that it will take um, only like 3% of the bandwidth uh, um, in comparison to video, so which is very important if you think of remote areas. We have Mandis, uh, which is um, a short for mental distress. This is a audio mental health survey that we um, piloted in Pakistan, where beneficiaries that cannot read or write can um, like uh, fill out a mental health survey um, using audio cues, and makes it this makes it, for example, um, possible to um, to um, to. Um, monitor um, the, the mental health status in, for example, in refugee camps or for NGOs to, uh, to monitor the mental health status of their beneficiaries. And also the before mentioned Quifi, which is a local Wi-Fi content server that helps, that can provide the contents free of charge without the need to connect to the internet, which is important where, in, in cases where you don't have any internet uh, connections. Also, for example, refugee camps. We started um, kicking things off with uh, with WOMFM. This is basically the first project we currently, which we currently had. Um, WOMFM is a simple web app to provide educational audio content. You can see it here, um, a screenshot. It has been de deployed to offer health education, a number of initiatives in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And it is template based. So we have a template on GitHub and um, um, Women can, soft, uh, female developers can basically uh, copy the template to their uh, account and start working on it. So basically, this is a very, very easy way of starting to use open source for such kind of projects. And we have used this approach for the first time in Uganda back in July, August, where we had, uh, we started off with an open source for Equality Day, where we were convening stakeholders from government, from NGOs, from uh, local developers, etc., and where we started an open source for Equality Contributon, um, which um, had um, five uh, local female developers build uh, one of M solutions for local NGOs and, and CBOs in four languages. Language is, of course, an important thing. Um, in Uganda alone, we have like 40, 50, 40 to 50 different local languages, and you have to provide those contents in the local languages in order to increase the acceptance and in, in order to really, um, well, um, create a behavior change uh, uh, out of this. So, and those, um, those solutions will be used and are being used by local um, NGOs, which can um, uh, use them in, in their community outreach um, uh, projects. So, this is the idea behind that. Have local stakeholders develop solutions, open source solutions for local organizations. And... And this is basically the change. So on the right, you saw, um, uh, you see, you're seeing um, my initial slide, one of the initial slides, uh, with uh, showing how community outreach works today. The guy with a megaphone who who um, ends up in the, in this village like two two times per year, and people cannot take any notes because people are literate. So basically, it, it's it's very questionable what what they will get out of this. They will get something, but but uh, you cannot leave the brochure with them. So basically, um, this is not sustainable. This is not efficient. On the left, you see what happens if 
And even in a situation, this is, uh, this is one of our projects in Pakistan, where not all the women have smartphones, but some have. And if you empower those smartphone owning women and tell them, okay, you, we will buy you some airtime and we will send you some audios uh, every now and then. And every week you can, you can um, join with a group of women and you can play back those audios. So this makes even, even in such situations, makes digital audio very, very efficient and very, very scalable. And there are other benefits of having women um, um, basically joining in a group because they have a safe space where they can talk about uh, stigmatized topics like gender-based violence or uh, menstrual health. And the, the important thing between those two pictures is on the left, the knowledge stays with the women. They are the owners of the knowledge. It's on that smartphone and they can play it back whenever they want. They can play it back five times if they don't, if they think, oh, I didn't understand that well, they can play it back and back. On the right, the knowledge vanishes with, with this guy and, and it's questionable what, what will stay there at all. So this is a sustainable way to provide um, knowledge to marginalized populations using open digital tools. So in the end, we can say um, that the third definition of open source for equality uh, would be that we aim to be a facilitator for organizations and individuals wishing to support open source for equality projects in the global south. So um, that does mean, I mean, we, we, we are already receiving some, some support, for example, from Red Hat, but um, we aim to work both with development uh, organizations, with, with, with donor organizations, with development agencies, but also with commercial, um, I would say, pref preferably IT organizations, because they, um, they understand the power of digital tools, they understand the power of open source. And if our goal is really to connect those organizations with organizations in the Global South to jointly work on projects that help uh, empower uh, women in the Global South, that help promote um, gender equality. Um, and uh, finally, um, to um, hopefully, um, uh, which will lead to a sustainable um, society, a sustainable world for all of us. Um, when we talk about SDG 5, and we've been talking about SDG 5 the whole time, um, achieving um, gender equality, well, the latest numbers are in. Uh, the UN says it will take like 99.5 years from now. Gates uh, Foundation says it's, it's 86 years. So, um, well, you can take both of that. We, we can really say we are way off track uh, when it comes to achieving and attaining the sustainable development goals. So even more uh, this, it's even more important today to think about scalable solutions that help um, empower women and, and uh, obtain uh, gender equality. And we believe we have something here um, with, that we have a blueprint uh, that can work. And, and currently we are kind of building this up. As you saw, we have a first pilot project in Uganda. We are aiming to have a second project um, uh, with a larger scope also in Sub-Saharan Africa um, in the last quarter of this year. But we are building community. So we have, um, uh, we have our GitHub repositories. We have the website osec.org where, where, where we are already matching um, organizations, NGOs with developers, where we're creating community. And, and, but this is just the start. So basically we are looking for, uh, for developers who want to mentor. We are looking for, of course, for funding from organizations who, who like the idea and would like to participate in it. And um, yes, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you very much for um, listening and watching and feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Thank you. So are there questions in the audience? Sure. Um, when you say you're trying to make contact with local uh, NGOs there, I, like catch my eye on Desert Children. Desert Children, those don't seem to be like a local one. Are you targeting the, like the national, the local uh, NGOs? Like, because normally like funding comes from like UN or big donors, then goes to those uh, the children, IRC, then it goes to the latest beneficiaries, and those are the local ones. Those are what I at least are from a humanitarian perspective. This is what I call as a local organization. Like, where do you make your contact in order to reach the lower level citizens? 
Yeah, good question. I, I will repeat it uh, for, for, for uh, the, the audience that is uh, uh, watching virtually. So basically the question was about, okay, how can we ensure that uh, local um, NGOs are involved because you saw the Save the Children logo. The Sa Save the Children logo was actually there because our partner in Uganda was Re Responsive Innovation Lab. They are uh, kind of an organization that was created by Save the Children, Oxfam and some others. Just to do that, to connect basically um, um, digital um, uh, innovators with uh, local um, organizations, and uh, as you say, uh, you're totally right. This is this is key. Um, what what you are explaining, what you've been explaining, is this trickle down approach. So basically, the, the donor organizations, uh, like the German government, give give money to the UN and and, and to GIZ, the German Development uh, Agency, and from there it, it, it's supposed to trickle down. And and we know and for, we know for a fact that 0.5% um, of development aid is actually ending up, for example, with women's organizations, 0.5%. So um, this is in, in stark contrast to what I've been saying uh, about the importance of SDG 5, gender equality. So um, how does that, uh, how do you make uh, ends meet, uh, if you know that? Um, yeah, I, I would assume and hope that open source helps us with that. Because when we work with local organizations, like for example, the open source community Africa, and uh, she code Africa, for example, in Africa, those are already there and, and they can um, basically connect with local CBOs and, and local NGOs. We, and, and, and we are trying also to build a platform for that because um, um, for, for me, um, one ideal situation would be if we could really reach the small organizations, the community-based organizations, because as you know, NGOs, they have their funding and then after two or three years, they move on to something. But the community-based organizations, they stay there. But, but they're usually like totally underfunded and, 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 uh, and uh, overworked. So, and, and they cannot afford to, 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 uh, to have like a digital transformation. So if we provide them with um, tools that can be adapt, uh, adapted by local uh, stakeholders, by local developers, then my, my dream would be really to empower those local organizations to use digital tools. And, and this is kind of more like a grassroots approach because I, actually I, I, don't, I don't believe that the, the trickle-down approach will help with, it, with, with this. We need to create the situation where we cre create a grassroots approach where a local developer in Uganda says, hey, I've heard about this open source for equality thing. I can build you, hey, you're a women's CBO. Uh, I like you and I have a friend that works for you. I can build you a, a solution. Why don't we sit together? So that would be the ideal situation. That, so that no development aid is, isn't involved at all. So that this, this, uh, this will, would be created for, from, from a grassroots level. Um, I mean, we think we have a good idea here, but it's, it's, we are still in early, uh, uh, so this is at an early stage. But, but this is what we're, what we're trying to do, because we also, well, we have our, uh, well, our experience uh, with how development uh, cooperation works, and we want to do things differently. But as you, as you know, if you have a humanitarian background, um, changing the structures and is, 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 a, is a tough job. So we, we shall see uh, how this will work out. But thanks for the question. Yeah. Can I sure, sure. Yeah. I have to face a couple of the challenges of trying <laughs> to take it from like bottom from like the people usually have the best defense themselves and taking it up. One of the biggest challenges might be uh, this doesn't fit in our budget. Like this is what like set the children and all those like vegetarian people would say. Like yeah. this doesn't fit with our budget. It's not like within our um, theory of change, it doesn't fit with our like framework <laughs> and like it's not an output or an outcome we're looking for. That's that's something maybe like your organization as a humanitarian maybe should advocate more for that in order like to bring the projects that coming from the local and this is where we put the funding rather than the funding coming from the top and then distributed according to the framework coming from the donor. I totally agree with you. Um, so to, to repeat that, um, the, um, the 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 question was okay. Um, um, the, the the challenges of of basically funding uh, those uh, uh, alternatives um, because they don't fit into the funding schemes that are established in, in development cooperation. Totally agree. I think there is some slight change, for example, um, we, we've been just uh, talking about UNDP Digital X. So you, you, United Nations Development Program has set up like a curated list of, of open solutions and they provide like funding to the local UNDP um, offices to implement those uh, locally in their countries. 
this is like a first step, not not exactly the solution to to every problem. But actually, um, uh, my hope is, and, and we have had like good experiences with CSR, uh, uh, corporate spo uh, social responsibility uh, programs in the past. My hope is that uh, that more and more um, uh, IT organizations would chip in and say, yeah, that makes sense. Um, we would like to participate, not only by funding, but also by providing our ex uh, expertise in, in, in mentorship and all that stuff. Because if we can basically link um, um, IT organizations in, in the global north uh, with local organizations there, like Open Source Community Africa, everybody wins. Um, and even uh, even uh, the IT organization might find a future developer down there, because, I mean, we're, we are more and more working remotely. So um, CSR is one one of my my hopes um, to uh, to provide like a more flexible funding mechanism for that. But I, I totally agree with you. Um, everybody's talking about digital public goods and open tools, but nobody has figured out yet how the funding funding mechanisms should work. And still, as of today, um, yeah, the funding mechanisms uh, that are in place in development cooperation are project related, like you get two or three years, and not platform related. So basically, okay, it's not like like a technology uh, project would work and say, okay, yeah, we have like a ten years f time frame or, or whatever. So yeah, I, I totally um, I totally agree with you. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, um, when you made that slide of challenges and problems. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, and uh, we're, we're talking. Uh, if we're talking about the global so south, of course we're talking about gender norms. I mean, we have we have similar projects over here, uh, problems over here. Um, the workload of the African women is twice as high as, as, as the workload of African men. So this is this is the fact, and, and changing that will will take time, and and it it's, it is incredibly difficult so uh, actually uh, I must say I, I don't I don't have a really great answer for that because it's, it's as you say it's a systemic change um, you have to, to 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 well you have to change gender norms and of course we are seeing we are seeing progress um, uh, regarding changing those gender norms but it's it's, it's very very slow and um, so um, I, I really admire those women who who manage to um, to go ahead and, and and kind of build a career, for example, software development, engage in open source in the global south. But uh, I see that um, I mean the price for doing that is 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 very high, and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be uh, that high. And and the point is, I mean, if we if we think about um, and, and what I've presented you is is a huge challenge because. Um, we were talking about what you said, um, household chores, gender norms, but um, internet access is, is of course also a financial issue. So basically when we had our first project, well, one of the first learnings was, yeah, we have to provide like airtime um, to, to, to participants beforehand. I mean, we, we paid a stipend afterwards, but we, we have to do that differently. Um, some have don't have access to, to computers because uh, at some point they said, yeah, um, I have a smartphone and maybe I, I, 
I'm, I'm not focusing that much on, on that development, software development career, so I can sell my laptop and whatever. So it is very, very difficult. And uh, um, I, I don't have a really good answer how we can change that. Um, it, it, it takes patience, but the, the point is really um, overall, it needs more focus and more investment in in in, uh, in women's em uh, to empower women, especially in the global south. I mean, we it's it's clear that we've neglected this over 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 decades, and the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, it, it will still take almost a hundred years to to reach that, um, and, uh, and and taking into account that COVID uh, wasn't very helpful for that, so. Um, um, we, we had increasing numbers of gender-based violence, not only in the South, but also in the global North. Um, um, women are the first ones who, who will um, uh, suffer from um, economical downturn, the first ones who will suffer from, uh, from natural catastrophes, the first one who will suffer from, from war and, uh, and all that. So um, we need to invest more in, in into making women more resilient, into into offering more opportunities, etc. I mean, what what we what we are doing is like a small grain of sand. But um, the thing is, everybody agrees that we need to do that. But um, I'm I'm finding it difficult to really see the the big breakthrough and 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 the, and the progress. So hopefully uh, we will see it over the next decades. But this is still this is a, this is like a, a marathon, an ultra marathon. And this is, uh, but yeah, you have to start somewhere, and 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 I admire those women who who make it and who who become role models for others. So you have to uh, uh, you have women to, to spearhead and to uh, really um, take take all that work of of, of of building something there in order to f have role models. And my hope is that now that we have some role models, more will follow. So this is, I, I think this is like a. Um, this is like a, like a like a mechanism that that will that will be uh, hopefully dynamic, but but um, yeah, there's still a long 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 way to go. So, thank you again. <laughs> Have a nice day.